Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Richard McElreath. Um, he's a professor uh, of anthropology and the director of the Department of Human Behavior, Ecology and Culture at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. He also wrote a very popular Bayesian statistics textbook. Uh, his research interest lies in integrating theory with data analysis and study design. He thinks that too many researchers uh, treat research like a hobby and that actual professional standards are needed. Um, for instance, today we'll argue how we as scientists can learn from other professions like software engineers. So Richard, thank you for accepting our invitation. I know many attendees are looking forward to your ever entertaining uh, presentations. All right. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming to hear me say some uh, um, hopefully interesting analogies. And I'm going to try to uh, get through this at a good pace. So maybe we have a little bit of time for questions at the end. I know we have time constraint. Uh, so yeah, I want to draw some analogies between science as a profession and other professions, specifically software development, um, but also cooking. Uh, so let me get to that too. Um, so the what I study, yeah, I, I'm an anthropologist. What I study is why people exist. Yeah, which I think is a deep puzzle that still is unexplained. Um, when the context of this problem as a scientific problem goes is really terrible. It's it's kind of the worst possible scientific problem you can study because it's it's an empirically really intractable thing. So here's the big overview uh, of why my occupation is is hard. So um, this is life on Earth me measured in gigatons of carbon which uh, is not how you usually evaluate life, but this is how much it weighs, right? And car carbon is the main thing that we are, right? Stardust. And uh, most uh, life on Earth is plants. Now, that's what you see in this diagram it's from this 2018 paper on biomass distribution. And then the little gray triangle in the corner is animals, of which um, there's just two gigatons of carbon in total. And then if you zoom in on animals now on the right of this slide, um, you'll see that uh, humans aren't even that much of all the animals, right? It, insects uh, and fish are, uh, dominate. And uh, But here's the amazing thing about people. Um, humans and our livestock are essentially all of the mammals on Earth. Essentially all of the mammals on Earth are humans and our livestock. Uh, we're just completely weird, dominant sort of species. Uh, uh, if you expect any kind of species to dominate Earth, you expect a plant or an insect, right? <laughs> this is uh, a weird thing for us to do. Um, and trying to figure out what produced this, this weird kind of ape that gives online lectures, right? We, we, as a profession, we have this very integrative and difficult empirical problem of figuring out the history of uh, where we came from and our ancestors and then how we... we um, people, the world, and, and so on. And this is a big interdisciplinary project that involves all kinds of messy evidence and modeling, right? Because um, we can't do experiments. Uh, we need dynamic models to make any sense of the data at all. And this is, I love this. It's an absolutely wonderful sort of problem, but it's very, very difficult. And uh, why am I telling you this? This is not an anthropology lecture. Well, I, I like to remind people that anthropology exists uh, and uh, maybe you should do some. But um, also that this is a kind of scientific problem that exemplifies uh, the large scale version of what all scientific problems have is that in science, we're trying to generate some knowledge about the world, um, explain why it is the way it is, and uh, uh, maybe just for the sake of explanation, but potentially to do interventions in the future. And to do this right, we need to somehow integrate our work with the work of other people into some common body of knowledge uh, that we can agree on um, and we can audit and justify. This is this process of continuous integration of updating of, of scientific beliefs. Um, and th the way this is done in science is usually almost entirely chaotic, right? This is the thing that philosophers of science will tell you is that there is no scientific method. Um, it's, it's sort of like chaos reigns um, and nevertheless, it's amazing that we learn things, right? Um, but there are professions who have an analogous problem. Uh, and 
they have professionalized this process of continuous integration in a way that science has not. And I'm not going to argue that we should um, have some strict formalized version of how we do this. Uh, what I am going to argue is that we could do a whole lot better uh, uh, by looking at other uh, occupations. So the, the primary analogy I'm going to look at is software development. Uh, be, and one reason to focus on this is because a lot of contemporary science involve software development. This is not a this is a thing that I think shocks a lot of people when you get into science. You're fascinated by some scientific context and then you learn you have to code, right? It's terrible. It's like a bait and switch, right? To get interested in psychology, uh, now you have to learn R. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, sorry, but this is just the way it's going to be from now on. And so this software development is now a routine part um, of being a professional scientist. And even if you don't code yourself, you're using software and you have a responsibility to understand uh, how it works. And um, uh, software development is a profession that has lots of professional tools about how to do continuous integration of code and work in teams. Uh, so uh, I'm only gonna be very light on these things because you can read about these things uh, on your own later, but um, teams of programmers uh, have a very professionalized culture about how they work together. And when you train as a as a software developer, you train uh, to learn a common stack of tools so that wherever you end up working on whatever project, you can work with people and you can work with people in a way that does quality control. And this this whole uh, uh, ecology is something called continuous integration, um, and it involves uh, code development and testing and uh, lots of detailed things like separation of different kinds of, of edits, things called branches. Um, and but it's very professionalized now. And it's actually also quite new. I would say really the last 20 years have been a period of very rapid professionalization and tool building in software development, software engineering. And research software engineering is the side of this that's just getting started where we take some of these tools, not necessarily the whole package that I have on the screen here, we're not interested in copying them, but we're interested in borrowing the things that we need. So version control and testing uh, are things that are becoming more common in the sciences, but are still incredibly rare. Um, I'll try to convince you of that as we go. Maybe you don't need convincing. Now, to give you a specific example, here's a project that I've uh, invested a lot in myself. This is the, the Stan Math Library. And we use this to do uh, statistics, uh, arbitrary models. And this is a project where the people at the core of it are professional software engineers, and they keep it all integrated together. There are dozens of programmers making contributions to Stan at any particular time and at different levels. Um, and this all has to work in the end. And the thing I want to emphasize to you that is a really stark contrast to how um, science is done. And uh, think about the code for a second, but it's just the whole ecology of data and hypothesis testing and the relationships between hypotheses and, and statistical models. The really stark contrast here is that most of the code in the STAN project is code that exists only to test it and guarantee that it works as planned. So that's what I show you here. This is, this is old. If you went and looked at it, there'd be even more code now, but there's 3.6 megabytes of library code. That's the code that you'd actually run if you if you use Stan to do a project. Um, and there's 7.6 megabytes of testing code, which is the code that is there for quality assurance. And this is quite typical of professional software uh, uh, projects, especially in the open source community, um, is that you'll have uh, twice the three times as much testing code as actual um, deployed code. And that's necessary, though, because this is a profession and they want to know that it works. Um, let me do another analogy, and then I'm going to run through some examples that are closer to science and really about science, if you're not so interested in software engineering. So there's this uh, great old article, kind of lost article from Cosmopolitan magazine from 1967 called The Computer Girls. And I only bring this up, but it's a weird historical case. But there's this fantastic quote from a very famous computer scientist named Grace Hopper, um, I can zoom in on it here. Grace Hopper is a real legend in computer programming. She developed the first linker, which is like a compiler. It's not exactly like a compiler, but she was really a big deal early on in making the modern world as we know it in computing. And um, she was an admiral in the Navy, in the United States Navy. And uh, so there's a great quote. They got her the uh, quote for this article in Cosmo, which is a real, really is something. It says, 
um, they're talking about programming and what it's like. And uh, back then, lots of women worked in, in software development, uh, still do, but the proportion was higher back then. And she says, oh, it's just like planning a dinner, explains Dr. Grace Hopper, now a, a, a star scientist in systems programming for UNIVAC. Um, you have to plan ahead and schedule everything so it's ready when you need it. Programming requires patience and the ability to handle detail. Women are naturals at computer programming. Uh, so this analogy to cooking is a really nice one because programming is a lot like cooking. If, if those of you who like to do cooking and, and uh, uh, Dr. Hopper's analogy is very apt, I think. Um, but it, it, it's also apt in the same professionalism sense, right? That um, cooking as a profession is also very organized and streamlined. It has really strict regimens for how people work together in kitchens. Uh, if you just cook at home and you're a bit sloppy with it and, you know, you're just using feeling, right, as Uncle Roger would say, those of you who know Uncle Roger, right, just use feeling. Um, this is not this is not how professional kitchens actually work. And uh, professional kitchens are professional. Uh, there are a bunch of rules about how you stand at stations and how you move through the kitchen and, and how everything is processed, um, where you leave your knives. I mean, anybody who's worked in a kitchen, you know this stuff. But all of this is necessary for making the kitchen run smoothly and, and things can fall apart. This isn't exactly the same as continuous integration and knowledge, but it's continuous integration of the meal, right? And there's an assembly line here that has to produce a lot of food at exactly the right time. And they start in the morning and they make it work. Yeah. Okay. So just say there's nothing special about software development as the analogy. It's just that there are professions and where there are lots of culturally evolved rules for making the profession work better. And unfortunately, I think science is not one of them. Uh, yeah, I am a scientist and I love science, but come on, we're, it's, it's kind of a mess in here, isn't it? Uh, here's my favorite quote uh, about this. This is from the uh, previous editor-in-chief of The Lancet, which is uh, the most prestigious medical journal in the world, I think, or at least it used to be until this quote came out. <laughs> no, uh, uh, So Horton was at a kind of closed door meeting of uh, heads of granting agencies and journals in the UK uh, back in, in 2015. And after that meeting, I mean, he couldn't share any exact quotes because it was closed door, but he wrote an editorial uh, in The Lancet about this meeting and uh, lots of the shocking things that had been reported on. Um, so this is the quote, and you'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll read it. Um, the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue, afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance. Science has taken a turn towards darkness. Yeah. <laughs> um, the only thing I disagree with here is the end. I think we've been in darkness for a long time. Uh, that is, I'm going to make that argument later. This is not a new set of problems, even though the details are perhaps different because the incentives are constantly changing in science. It's never at equilibrium. Um, but these sort of dark problems have always been around, uh, and we still learn things. Uh, so this isn't an argument that science doesn't work. It's an argument that we could do a whole lot better and that we are currently violating the public's trust. And I think this is a deep ethical problem, the lack of professionalization in our field. Um, okay. So people who are enrolled in this summer school, uh, this stuff is not going to shock you, right? You, you, there are still scientists who've never heard that science has problems, but not, not the people who are enrolled in this. Yeah, uh, you're here because you're interested in, in trying to do better. P-hacking is this uh, great uh, term. It's a terrible practice, but it's a great term that, that has done a lot, I think, to draw attention to some of these problems. And it's a uh, a fairly famous case now. There are even online uh, guides to, to show you how it works. Um, and this has gotten a lot of attention. But my opinion is that there's a, a bunch of stuff in the stream of integration of how we do uh, science that is quite different than p-hacking uh, in the sense that it has more to do with unintentional error than intentional error. And the unintentional kind of errors uh, can be much more devastating uh, in principle. And I want to show you some examples of those things today and talk about how analogies to software engineering, or if you prefer, working in a professional kitchen uh, can help us um, uh, do better over time. So let me try to back this up. Uh, so here's this article from Nature in 2016 where they're talking about the replication crisis and such. And they asked a bunch of scientists um, about various, you know, uh, vaguely unethical practices or kinds of mistakes they make. And then at the top here, we've got the things that I would classify, you know, in 
like using Dante's Inferno kind of categories as greed. We've got selective reporting, pressure to publish, low statistical power, poor analysis. So there's things where scientists are, are conscious uh, of these things, at least in the, in the periphery of their consciousness. And they know it's not quite right to do these things, but they do it because of, of professional incentives. Uh, and then there's this middle category, which I call sloth. And this is what I like to focus on. It's the sloth problem, right? The lack of professionalization. Um, it's people don't even remember how to replicate their own work. Um, yeah, this often happens in, in labs uh, and uh, they didn't take detailed enough notes and no one can get the thing to work again. Um, or you don't have your code, right? Your code doesn't run. Uh, insufficient oversight, uh, methods code unavailable, poor experimental designs, um, uh, not having the data and so on. And uh, lots of problems like this where people aren't trying to be bad, right? It's just that there aren't, there isn't this kind of professional training and a set of norms uh, for doing better. Um, and, and that's what I want to talk about. Let me give you a few specific examples. Uh, you'll indulge me here. So, uh, and these are famous examples. Apologies if you've heard them before. Um, I've reached that phase of my life where I'm telling the same story over and over again. Uh, I need to do better about that. But uh, so here's this example from economics. Uh, uh, Two, um, I think Harvard uh, economists, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff in 2010 published this, this paper. It was a preprint at the time, Growth in a Time of Debt. And this came out, um, remember there was this recession in 2008, right? And there were a bunch of international debates about public spending uh, in order to stimulate the economy and so on. And uh, th this paper made the argument based upon this single graph that um, public debt is bad for growth, that there's a negative correlation between uh, the, 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 GD, the debt to GDP ratio, which is on the horizontal axis, and the percent growth in GDP. And um, uh, so this is the whole paper, basically, is this graph. And this paper actually had a big impact in parliaments and in the U.S. Congress. It was, in the U.S. Congress, it was actually waived on the floor of the U.S. Congress in a debate about public spending. Um, anyway, uh, it turns out the, the data were wrong. The analysis was just wrong. It was just an Excel error. And, um, here's, uh, uh Thomas Herndon pointing at the error in the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, these are the, the unsung heroes of science, the people who actually look at the, the, the detailed analysis and figure out, um, how the results work. And in this case, um, Thomas uh, saw that there was just a formula error. And they had failed to include some countries that went against that trend. And once you actually drug the formula down all the way in the Excel sheet, the result vanished. Uh, this is the actual spreadsheet. You can see that uh, if you know how Excel works, uh, uh, first of all, apologies. I'm sorry that life has done that to you, that you have to use Excel. It's, it's, it's a terrible tool. But um, that blue bounding box that you see is where the formula uh, input ranges. And you see that they just excluded some countries um, down below, and those go against the trend. Uh, so it's an error, yeah. And um, but lots of policy was made on the basis of this paper before the error was discovered. This is sloth, right? This is not. This was not an intentional deception either, because the authors provided the spreadsheet. They weren't trying to cover anything up. They wanted to get this right, right? This is the kind of thing that arises from a sloppy way of working and using a tool like Excel, which is not designed for scientific analysis and provides no, or let's say very few tools for quality control and inspection. Yeah, you know, it's designed to be convenient and visual, and that is exactly what you don't want uh, in, in a profession like this. Okay, Excel, I'm gonna pick on Excel, sorry, but uh, uh, Excel does lots of other terrible things because it's not a tool designed for science. It's a tool designed for business people to make tables, right? That's what it's for. And, um, uh, it it does a bunch of stuff without your consent. It'll just convert data. Right? Everybody who's used this knows that it, it it likes to find dates in things. Right? Uh, uh, Excel is 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 like that annoying guy who thinks everything's a date. Right? <laughs> and uh, it converts all kinds of stuff to dates. And so gene names. This is the famous case. There are various um, gene names, and these are abbreviations, and they get converted. So like Septin one keeps getting converted to September first. Yeah, and uh, this is terrible because a huge proportion of published uh, genomics papers have these errors that are introduced by Excel, and they this is a significant problem in the genomics literature. Um, and so 
for a long time, biologists have tried to get Microsoft to do something about this behavior, but Microsoft just doesn't care about the scientific community, right? Again, their marketplace is business people making tables, and that's what Excel is for. Um, so eventually, um, the biologists decided they would just change the abbreviations of the genes. So this creates another problem is you've got old papers that use the old system and have these errors and you have new ones and it's a never ending cycle. It's a snake that eats its own tail. Uh, but the problem is the tool and the fact that it, there's no professional standard for what tool we're supposed to be using. Yeah, this is the using Excel is like the equivalent of just, uh, you know, leaving your knife out in a kitchen or something like that. Yeah, these are things you're not supposed to do. Um, the consequences of things like this are, are, are really serious. And, and again, a lot of you know about this, but these audits of reproducibility of research findings are quite depressing, right? So here's, here's just one from 2012 that, that helped snowball some of this concern in biology. Uh, uh, Bayer tried to replicate a bunch of uh, published results and um, only about 25% of them could be validated. Uh, this is a serious problem. This is a, a waste of public funding when the public is paying for it. Yeah, if only 25% of, of supposed discoveries can even be validated in any sensible way to be pursued further. Um, and uh, th these are serious issues. And again, this is probably not news to you. This is this is kind of old news at this point. Uh, but these things are arising in teams where no one's trying to get away with anything, or at least I don't think most of this is fraud. Most of this is sloth, you know. And, and professionalization will help. Okay, very quickly, I, I said something earlier that I don't think the darkness is new. This is a fantastic history of science book called The Lost Elements, and I just want to advertise it to those of you who like history of science. Um, it's, a, it's a history of all the elements in the periodic table, and there was a lot of false elements. Uh, there, this book catalogs more false discoveries of elements than real elements that currently exist. Uh, so it isn't like, I mean, now when we teach the periodic table, we teach it like this immaculate thing that sprung forth from the forehead of Athena or something, right? And we just got it right. But that's not what it was. It was a mess out there because it, science wasn't professionalized then either. Uh, it's more professionalized now than it was then. So maybe we're doing better. I don't know. Uh, but I want to say this is not like it's some new problem that's caused by, you know, uh, late 20th century capitalism or something like that. Okay. Um I have complained about things like this for some time, and and I'm unfortunately developing a reputation for this. So this is this natural selection of bad science paper comes up again, and I only mention it to say that uh, it's this this same point is that I think it's easy to focus on deliberate attempts to get away with things like like um, uh, thinking about people doing fraud and such, and those things matter, and and there's probably more fraud than we we uh, know, um, but I think that the norms in science have sort of evolved to satisfy particular careerist ends rather than reliability ends. And that's the basic problem is this cultural evolutionary process where we're incentivized uh, to get promotions. Um, but it's very hard to know if you're right in science. And most of us will probably die before we know if we were right about what we study, right? Um, and I'm starting to get this feeling, but I'm going to keep doing it. I start to get this feeling that's summarized by this slide that I'm standing around discussing science reform quite calmly all the time. And meanwhile, science is just like flipping out in the background. Um, but this is just what it's like. And we have to, nothing's in equilibrium. And the ideas for communities like the ones that I'm a member of, and many of you are too, we need to keep discussing these things, even though it's not clear how we're going to fix the whole system right now, because we need to be ready with serious policy recommendations when the opportunity arises. And it will arise because governments are getting really interested in that flipping out car in the background. And when I talk to people in high level leadership, uh, they've all heard about this, people in government, uh, heads of granting agencies. Uh, the moment is coming when communities that are interested in open science and science reform are going to be able to have a big influence, especially in Germany, um, uh, which is where I know people I've talked to about this, but also in the UK, which has gotten really serious about it. Uh, this is the hopeful message, right? You focus on the car, but but uh, there will come a time when we will have safety standards in place. Um, okay. So this is the argument about, about the natural selection of bad science is science as a profession does a really good job of making successful scientists, right? And that's sort of how it is. Professors make professors, right? And so um, the professors who train their students to be good at being a professor, those are the sorts of traditions that will propagate. And so these are skills like how to get funding, how to get published, how to get cited. 
how to give credit, which is also a thing that helps you professionally. Um, and, and research skills themselves, the professional aspects, the continuous integration, the testing, uh, the programming skills, if you will, the kitchen etiquette, where you leave your knife, um, how you avoid cutting your thumb off. Yeah, things like that. These things are in most contexts informally transmitted. People learn them at the bench with their colleagues in the lab sciences. They learn them from published papers in behavioral sciences. Uh, there isn't a lot of professionalization about how these skills are taught. People just kind of pick up coding, right, from their peers or from online tutorials. Um, uh, it, we could do a lot better. Uh, the things that are rarely taught but are essential professional skills uh, for the sciences broadly defined are things like how we organize our data, how we curate it, how we do testing of our procedures, uh, which I think is almost never done. People hardly ever test their code at all. Um, how we manage distributed contributions. This is the continuous integration analogy. Um, and then this point at the end that I'm going to focus on a bit uh, strongly for the remainder of my time here is the logical connections between hypotheses and data analysis. And I think this is a real dark hole in the sciences broadly defined. I don't think there's a single science currently uh, doing a good job at this, even though in the stats community, there's been a lot of work on this over the last, say, 100 years. Um, it's not the sort of thing that is really focused on. Instead, we sort of focus on null hypothesis testing, right? And um, uh, But the logical connection between scientific hypotheses, not null hypotheses, but the actual hypothesis and data analysis is something we could do a lot about desperate need to professionalize this more. Um, so the... the couple of things about sloth, right? So you all know that there are these audits of the replicability uh, of studies. And this is just to talk about the curation side of this before I pivot to the logic. Um, so here's something that um, a student in my department did a few years ago. Rihanna Minoker uh, did this big audit of the social learning literature in humans and animals and just tried to figure out in what proportion of papers um, uh, the result could even be reproduced. This isn't about whether it's right or not but can we reproduce it at all? So uh, this was a, a huge task of emailing a bunch of people and trying to get raw data and then trying to actually take that data when it was available and reproduce the result. Um, this is a basic quality control thing, right? Uh, and at the end here, there's a bunch of details here, um, uh, but at the end, uh, the combined, the reproducibility combined from being able to get the data and then being able to understand the data processing procedures as documented, uh, is only about 24% in this literature. Uh, now, I ask you, if any any other profession you heard a number like this, what would you think, right? There's a bunch of products uh, being pushed out, and in only about 20% of the cases, um, can we even understand how they were produced and know that they're correct? Yeah, this is not acceptable. Yeah, and the social learning literature is not special in this regard. Here's a great paper from Antika Cholna and colleagues in 2020, uh, doing something very similar in ecology, trying to see just the availability of code. Uh, 346 articles um, randomly sampled and only about 20% is even potentially reproducible. Uh, we've got to do better. This is the curation and professionalization of data management, code management, right? This should be easy. Uh, we just need the will and the standards and say that it's not okay that you don't have code um, and so on. Uh, there's other detailed procedures that are closely, more closely related to software engineering that we need training for. And the, the training is a serious thing that people like me have to commit to provide. So at, at my institute, every year we have a week-long intensive course on these skills uh, to help out students. Um, but I know in a lot of programs, there isn't an annoying person like me who's going to force that to happen. But this is a professionalization thing, the, a campaign that I'm committed to. Things like version control. Um, uh, being per, uh, being very uh, uh, serious about controlling our documents and understanding the edits. This is like track changes in Microsoft Word, but for code. Uh, yeah, a very important aspect of, of being professional about code development. And then testing. Uh, you know your code, you want your code to be able to do something, you should write code to test it. And that's part of basic quality control as well. And as you, anybody who's coded knows, no matter how long you do it, you will make mistakes. And so the testing is not optional. And I, uh, any of you who've watched my stats lectures know this, 
Um, I test the data analysis by making synthetic simulations of the scientific hypothesis. And that's also a kind of testing that's unique to science that you wouldn't see in software engineering, but is also necessary is to say, can my data analysis pipeline, even in principle, get the analysis right? And we should prove that before we ever introduce real data to our pipeline, I think. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a strict and annoying person. I know, I recognize that. But I think that's a basic professional standard that I would like to, to, to lobby for. Documentation, can we understand what people did? Um, uh, I've talked about continuous integration. I think this is a positive message because there's this occupation called software engineering which has lots of training materials and has been professionalized and we can borrow a lot from them. We're gonna to have to adapt it to the way we work. I'm not saying we become software engineers, God forbid. Um, I like being a scientist. I don't wanna be a software engineer, but uh, there's a lot we can benefit from here. We don't have to develop it ourselves like they did. Yeah, they had a really hard job doing this stuff. Okay. Um, so, yeah, okay, so this is about, I should have put this up when I talked about version control. Yeah, copying documents and uh, renaming them is chaos because future you is going to be very confused um, by your folders, right? Uh, version control um, solves this quite a lot. Uh, and it, how do you learn these things? So if I mentioned at my institute, we teach a workshop on this every year and say you're interested in doing this yourself, you don't have to invent it yourself. There's this great organization um, called Software Carpentry, and they have a branch of their materials called Data Carpentry, which is really focused on scientists and essential skills for organizing data and, and having pipelines and managing projects with version control. And we use these materials in my institute. We modify them a little bit. Um, uh, we tune things, but these are excellent. It's really professionalized. And they'll train instructors too. You can send a member of your, of your team to their uh, instructor training. We've done that here. Um, it's really great. I, I hugely endorse this. You can, all the materials are free online. You can go through it on your own at home with a bottle of wine, if you like. It, it's, it's really great stuff. So we're living in the future. Um, we, we have benefited a huge amount from all of the professionalization in software engineering and the culture of things like this, of data carpentry and software carpentry. And we can uh, use these things to, to lift ourselves up now. Um, yeah, so let's say, uh, I work a lot with ecologists, and so there's a whole module uh, for ecologists, actually, and there's a module for psychologists, so it's even getting customized now to the different kinds of, of data needs and, and cleaning problems that you have. Uh, so I hugely endorse this, and I think this is the kind of thing, this kind of basic data carpentry certification is the kind of thing I'd like to see as a professionalization of being a scientist who works with data. Uh, which is basically all of us, right? Is to be able to say, yes, I've done this. It should be, so on our CVs, it's not that, you know, oh, I, I can use Microsoft Word. Well, of course you can, but no, you've gone through data carpentry and you've got the certificate. That would be a minimum kind of professional standard, I think. Um, version control for big projects requires bigger tools. And I just put this slide up uh, to advertise that those tools exist too, but you need other specialists to help that work. So in my department, we have, this kind of continuous integration of distributed databases with different people contributing data from different aspects of the project. And this has to be managed as well. And we do all this with database based with version control on a database. And it's very essential to do this kind of stuff too. This would be uh, impossible for an individual to manage without specialized training. So this is the we need teams where we have support staff who are focused on these sorts of things. And at Max Planck, we can afford this. And I appreciate that in other places you don't. But this is, again, just part of the professionalization. And um, research institutes that want to be taken seriously in the future, I think, will have to provide services like this. Um, OK, let me pivot to the logic, and then I'll stop uh, and, and take some questions in the last few minutes. Um, I'm very big on the idea that uh, we, we need to prove logically that that our data analysis could work in principle uh, and even in principle, that is given some stated set of assumptions uh, about our scientific hypothesis, uh, what we think is going on, um, would it be possible even in principle for our data analysis pipeline to work to show whether the hypothesis was true or not or to get the estimate uh, that we want? That's usually how I think of it. Um, and I think the standard way that data analysis is done in the sciences does not address this at all. Uh, people have quite vague heuristics about um, how they develop an estimator for things. 
uh, and there's no testing of any kind anyway. Uh, and so I, I put up this, this screenshot of Uta Pearl's book, because this is really the core of it is about causal inference, which is most of scientific research is about inferring causes. Um, uh, and uh, maybe you want to argue with me about that later on, but I defend that point quite strongly. And there is a science of this about being able to logically connect um, a generative model of a, of a natural phenomenon to uh, an estimator that is a statistical procedure for studying it. And that's what Uta Pearl, Uta Pearl's probably made the largest contribution to this of any single person, but there's hundreds of, of mathematical uh, uh, statisticians, computer scientists who work exactly on this issue. And um, we're living in the future again, and we just need to, to disseminate uh, these insights. So a couple of quick examples, and then I'm going to stop. Um, so here's here's a version of this that I was involved in personally with my colleagues, where um, people are, are doing data analyses, which are wholly unjustified. There's no logic that connects their statistical procedure to the uh, supposed scientific problem they're trying to solve. And so the, they're just publishing irrelevant estimates. Um, and in cases where it's provable that what they've done doesn't make sense. So there was this uh, period years ago where I got involved in this policing, biased policing debate about um, whether um, police, uh, mainly in North America, uh, tend to shoot uh, minority individuals more. And, um, and there were a bunch of papers on this trying to analyze administrative data and so on. And there's a bunch of statistical problems with these sorts of papers, which is how I got pulled into the vortex. Um, but also it's a very important civil rights issue, right? And, and when you have statistical uh, knowledge, I think you have an obligation to, to work on these things when the opportunity arises. But uh, so here's a paper that came out from Cesario and colleagues who are really trying to get things right. These are serious people who really care about the civil rights issues and they're doing the best they can, uh, but no one trained them in how to do this logical connection between the scientific hypothesis and, and the estimator. So they do this adjustment. They, they recognize that there's this problem with the administrative records and they do a statistical adjustment, right? And, um, and then they, they report on what happened with it. But their adjustment, uh, their adjustment in statistics could mean anything, right? It just means including some variable. And um, the particular adjustment they did just does not work. And so my colleagues and I, uh, uh, Cody Ross and Bruce Winterhalder, had this uh, follow-up paper where we are we nerd out basically. We like to do algebra. It's kind of kind of people we are, and we proved that the estimator that Cesario and I you all used uh, just doesn't work. It doesn't solve the problem uh, at all. In fact, it can actually um, give you exactly the wrong answer in these cases. Now, I don't mean to pick on Cesario because this is just a case that I was involved in, right? But this kind of thing goes on a lot. So let me give you one more example. Uh, so. Uh, there's, this is one maybe a lot of you've heard of, the hot hand effect. So there's this weird North American sport called basketball. And uh, back in the 80s, um, uh, some psychologists, Gilovich, Valona, and Tversky published this paper arguing that this thing called a hot hand doesn't really exist, but basketball players believe it does. The hot hand is his belief that players get on streaks. And when they're on a streak, a coach is supposed to recognize this and direct other players to pass the ball to them. And that will Im improve your, your odds of winning the game. So they did a data analysis of some data from professional games and, and said that the hot hand is a myth. Uh, players and coaches believe in it, but there's no statistical evidence of it. This paper was hugely influential and it was part of a big industry of arguing that people are irrational and, and so on. Okay, the paper is completely wrong, totally wrong. It's garbage, never teach it, okay? Uh, no, <laughs> here I am teaching it. Only teach it as a lesson of like how not to do data analysis. So the problem with the, the Tversky paper is that their data analysis procedure was completely ad hoc. They didn't uh, have any kind of generative representation of the hot hand phenomenon and then derive an estimator or anything like that. They just said, hey, what if we just looked at sequences of three shots and looked at how many streaks there are in there? And um, it turns out that this is a procedure that gives you deterministically the wrong answer. And there's this great paper uh, I show you on the screen from Miller and Sanjuro. I think this came out in 2018 or 2017, where they study this estimator that Tversky had all used, and it is always bad. Um, I mean, it's in, and it's especially bad in the way that Tversky and his colleagues used it. 
Um, and when and Miller and Sanjuro then went on to derive an actually good estimator, unbiased estimator, and they find that the hot hand does exist and the coaches and players were correct. <laughs> yeah, I love this story. Um, so uh, there's real value in, in professionalizing this ability to connect scientific models to data analysis as well. And it's obligation of people like me uh, to produce the materials and the training materials to help you do that, because this is not you're not on your own here. We're all in this together. Uh, we either we we all uh, sink or float together, right? And I think the simple version of this uh, this is a schematic. We have this four step plan to success. We want to express a theory as a probabilistic program um, and uh, uh, encode, and then prove that a planned analysis could work using that probabilistic program. Then we can step three: we test it on synthetic data, so we have the quality assurance, and our colleagues can believe that the estimator at least will work in principle. This would have saved Tversky, right? Um, and then we can run the thing on empirical data. There are additional problems after that of interpretation and model rejection, and maybe we go back to step one, and sure, everything is flow, and I don't think this is a linear sequence, but getting the quality control in here is really important, and the tools exist. We know how to do this in, in as a community. We just need to disseminate it and democratize it. Um, there's a bunch of detail in work for real workflows, which is like chaos. Now, I'm not going to work you through this, but there's this great paper called Bayesian Workflow by Andrew Gelman and his colleagues, where they they problematize all the little subflows that are in real scientific data analysis um, problems. And there's a bunch to do here. They they identify a bunch of areas for future research uh, to say this is a really active area of thinking about scientific workflow in a detailed way. And good things are going to come, uh, is what I want to say. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Uh, uh, sorry uh, if I run right to the end, I guess. Um, science is about continuous integration, and we should be professionals about this. We should not be ashamed uh, to show the public how we produced our results um, uh, or our work folders. And I guess that's my only message. Thanks for your indulgence. Thank you so much. You're getting a lot of applauses here and online, apparently. Oh, yeah, there's things floating on my screen. That's kind of <laughs> haunting. Um, okay. <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard a version of that presentation a while back, but uh, I, I got, again, very motivated. So I hope the new listener got inspired uh, as well. I see there are uh, several questions already in, um, in the Q&A box, uh, but we will also take... Um, did I stop the recording? 